Gebiere, uh, this microbrewing industry has been coming, uh, been becoming more and more successful and more popular in recent years. And I think in part it's a trend that's not unique to Japan, but it's something that's more popular elsewhere. Also, people are sort of becoming conscientious objectors to the big corporate interest, and they don't want to drink the the largest brand in town any longer, the uh, Asahi Super Dries, these kinds of famous brands. Um, although they're still widely available in you know, Jirahanbaiki and these convenience um, um, you know, vending machines everywhere, uh, the Jibiru has become the um, flavor alternative, right? And it has a bit of local flavor, it has a bit of local history, and in some cases um, it's got a lot of local entrepreneurship behind it. And I think that the um, the desire on the part of consumers to try something new is a big part of what's driving that industry. Like other industries that came after the opening of Japan in the mid 19th century, beer brewing got its start in the 1860s, mostly the 1870s, um, often in Yokohama and other places where foreigners were living. And then from there, very quickly, uh, Japanese people began to get interested in the business and started participating. Some of them were first-time brewers, others had been brewing sake for a long time, but uh, quickly a large number, perhaps as many as 120, 140 brewers, uh, cropped up all around the country. The company histories are supposed to be promotional, but many of them, uh, although they can be sort of dismissed as being promotional literature, are far better written and often far more revealing about the past in ways that don't have anything to do with the company at all. Um, in many cases, they tell stories about natural disaster, things that have taken place, um, major earthquakes and fires, and uh, the, uh, the you know, difficulties during the war era, they will describe this in words and in ways that um, very often other sources won't do or don't think to do. Um, official histories, uh, government histories, um, even archival material very often doesn't um, cover things in quite this way from the company's point of view. The other thing that's really useful about them is they're a really long-standing source. Um, they often, some of these companies were established in the 1870s and 80s and 90s, they are well over 100 years old. And for them, eras like those of natural disasters or wars and so forth are, are actually short periods of time. And they have a much longer view of things. So that's a very um, useful uh, advantage. Well, that trip came about um, in part in an effort to learn about Japan's uh, brewing companies that survived but also at the same time to try to find some information about those that did not. But I did go to uh, companies be from Okinawa uh, all the way through Honshu and into Hokkaido as well. Um, and uh, almost uniformly they were uh, very receptive, interested, and in one case in particular in, uh, in Okinawa, um, the, uh, one of the chief engineers and who was the quality control manager um, very kindly uh, after I explained my interest in his company and, in, in, and I explained my work, he went into his office and he came back out and he brought me a copy of their company history which had not been widely circulated and was available in no library in Japan, never mind in North America, and uh, he gave it to me personally. And I was really touched and I thought that was a, a very nice gesture on their part. And I, uh, as good as my word, translated the whole thing and uh, found a great deal of interesting things in it that had nothing whatsoever to do with Okinawa as as a military base or as a Cold War island or anything like that. Instead, it really spoke to Okinawa's history and how this uh, company started up in the 1950s and grew to be one of the most successful, most recognized companies, uh, Orion Beer, they call it Orion. The manuscript that I'm working on is um, in, in many stages between 1870 and 1970 designed to be um, an opportunity to look a little more deeply into Japan's past through the eyes of um, its companies. Um, whether they succeeded or failed, um, to me, I find they shed a great deal of light on what it was like to live at that time. We all know what goes on inside a brewery, what goes on in the kettles. It's not really all of that surprising, but uh, for me, it's the spaces between the companies themselves and their suppliers and their consumers. Um, because in the early days, especially when Japan was industrializing very often very slowly, um, those spaces were vast. Um, the challenge is just to get um, a, a company um, 
the opportunity to, to find materials and resources and ingredients and the difficulty selling the product, on the other hand, to consumers uh, was um, a, an insurmountable obstacle to many. And as time goes by and as the uh, companies become somewhat more successful, uh, the sales war between them heats up and becomes uh, severe and ultimately a cartel is formed. And this leads finally into the Second World War and then the period afterward of Reconstruction. So really this industry is one that was constantly uh, fraught with peril. Um, companies had a very difficult time, many did not survive. And um, the efforts of the government in some cases to intervene to help and in other cases to control the industry for the purpose of, of tax revenue during the war especially were um, serious problems. And um, Kirin, uh, the Kirin Beer Company in one case describes the uh, period uh, prior to the war as a, a period of unprecedented suffering, which is not generally the picture we get about the past and about Japan's industrial experience. Often we hear about um, unprecedented rampaging success, certainly in the 1950s and 60s after the war, but very often uh, these success stories are more complicated and uh, more difficult than they appear.